Uh, thanks very much. Um, we're just about back on time. Let me just introduce uh, our four panellists for the second panel. This theme is on job creation and education. Uh, on my immediate left is uh, Professor Len Shackleton, uh, Professor of Economics at the University of Buckingham, also a fellow here at the Institute of Economic Affairs and uh, a regular contributor to the IEA's work, um, both in terms of uh, writing and research, and also in terms of uh, appearing in an IEA capacity on the media for us. <coughs> on my immediate right is Elizabeth Truss, elected for, as the Conservative MP for South West Norfolk at the last election, a member of the Justice Select Committee, and of course convener of the Free Enterprise Group. On my far right is Priti Patel, Conservative MP for Witham, and a member of the Members' Expenses and Public Administration Select Committees, am I correct? Uh, and on my far left is David Rutley, the Conservative MP for Macclesfield, PPS to Damien Green, uh, who's the Minister of State for Immigration, previously member of the Treasury Select Committee. Uh, thank you to all four of you. The order I'm going to take uh, our panellists in is the order probably random, but they're in front of me on this list, which will go Len, uh, Elizabeth, Pretty, and then David. Len. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, academics are probably not the best people to go into this kind of speed dating talk on the things that I'll do that <laughs> best. Um, right, I want to uh, talk about three things really. One, uh, the need for continued cuts in public spending. Uh, which I think, uh, you know, we, we haven't begun to do that as, as sharper acts as lower taxes has suggested. Secondly, I want to um, mention one or two measures to, uh, in this area to encourage employment. And thirdly, uh, to talk about indirect ways in which we might reduce the burden on employers. So I'll start with the first. Uh, in the area which uh, we're talking about here, uh, I think there is still a lot of room for cuts in public spending. And, and just uh, three very quick ones. Um, we are apparently still going to raise the age of compulsory education from 2013 uh, through to 2015. Uh, this is something which both the uh, uh, members of the coalition voted against when it first went through Parliament, yet we seem to be stuck with it. This is going to cost us a lot of money. It's, a, it's not clear what the outcomes are expected to be from it, and of course it only works in England as well. So it's a very odd policy, which could be one for the chop, at least for postponing for a number of years. Uh, secondly, the extension of um, early schooling entitlements to now 40% of the age group. Uh, it's unclear what that is meant to achieve. Um, it's going to require a different system of, uh, of uh, determining eligibility because the current system for um, uh, free school meals, etc., doesn't cover anything like 40% of the, of the age group. Uh, the third thing, uh, near, near home for me, is the, uh, in higher education, is uh, dropping the planned uh, research excellence framework, formerly known as the research assessment exercise, uh, point of, uh, you know, a kind of pointless rebranding like consignia or something like that. Um, that is uh, a waste of money and time. We could transfer some of the funding to the research councils and shave probably a billion pounds off it, I think, uh, without any great loss to anybody apart from a lot of aggrieved sociologists. Right, uh, the second point I want to make is about encouraging employment. I think we have to make it easier for people, particularly on low earnings, to be self-employed. If you have a look through uh, this publication, you'll see that what determines who is self-employed is purely arbitrary, based on legal judgments. We could widen the scope of that, which would make it a lot easier for, for um, uh, people on low earnings to get into some kind of work, and for firms to take on other people to help them without necessarily incurring the full obligations of employers. Um, in a couple of areas which, we, uh, which are covered by this, this uh, rubric of this session, I think we should uh, look very carefully at the requirements for the early years foundation stage, uh, which is really raising the cost of childcare and making it more difficult for us to get affordable childcare. I know Liz has some views on this as well. And further up the educational ladder, I think we ought to look carefully at what we require uh, to become uh, a teacher in a secondary school, which I think could be liberalised. A lot of good people out there who could be working in secondary schools, which are put off by the procedures which you have to go through to become uh, a teacher, and particularly the, 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 the uh, certification uh, arrangements. The final area I wanted to mention very briefly was indirect ways of reducing the burden on employers. Uh, a policy I've argued for here before is to put caps on discrimination claims at tribunals at the moment, 
they are unlimited and can lead to awarding of huge amounts of money uh, for claims which uh, it's not clear that the employer was necessarily aware of what they were doing uh, when, they, uh, when they got into that kind of position. I can't see any reason why this should not be capped at the same level as unfair dismissals, currently around 75,000 a year, I believe. Um, secondly, and I note that um, uh, Liz again has thoughts on this, I think we should move towards uh, regional bargaining and public sector pay. I would go for very broad areas, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and probably London and the South East, with the rest of, the, uh, rest of uh, England as another group. I think this could be done, and I think the indirect effects of bringing down the cost of employing <coughs> people in some of our uh, depressed regions will be something which would be very beneficial. And finally, and possibly in a similar vein, uh, look very carefully at public, uh, public procurement procedures, uh, which uh, have accumulated a barnacle-like cluster of stuff on them, uh, which require anybody who wants to uh, take out, uh, you know, be a, a contractor for the public sector to commit themselves to a whole range of policies which they're not particularly good at doing and which are really there very largely out of political correctness. I believe that this keeps many smaller uh, businesses out of uh, public sector procurement. I think that's about that. Thank you. Lenny, thanks very much. Liz. Thank you. I think over the last decade uh, we saw a sort of seismic change in the global market for labour. We saw the emerging economies having many more educated people churning out engineers by the bucket load. We've seen technology change, which has delivered an hourglass economy. So the number of professionals and managers and high-skilled technical people has gone up by 30%. The numbers in the middle of skilled manual workers has gone down by 10%. And we've seen a growth in low-wage uh, low service sector as well. And during that decade, we've also seen a change in the way we do business much more flexible working, the rise of the Blackberry, working from home. But I think in comparison to what's been going on in the world, in Britain we've had a lost decade, our labour practices have fossilised and we've lost flexibility relative to the rest of the world. We're now 83rd in the world in terms of regulation. A critical failure has been to improve our education system as fast as other countries and despite having some of the best research capability in the world, our basic skills are worse than France, Germany or the US, our main industrial com Western competitors. One of my concerns is maths education is particularly poor. We're 28th in the World League table. We've got the smallest proportion of 16 to 18 year olds studying maths and I perhaps slightly disagree with Len about the requirement to carry on till 18. In fact, I think we should be looking at the Vorderman recommendations about how we get more people studying maths to 18 how we stop uh, the government funding low-value courses which don't contribute uh, to future skills and future economic welfare, and certainly how we get rid of national pay bargaining so that we can see good teachers valued, um, poor teachers uh, not given the rewards. But these kind of changes are going to take 10 years to achieve. <coughs> Germany had a massive change to its education system 10 years ago. It's now beginning to deliver. Well, what we need to think about now is what can we do to help people to get into work or who are about to enter the workforce? How can we make it easier for businesses to take people on? And there's been a lot of argument in the public debate about these kind of deregulatory approaches won't have any effect. That's not the real issue in Britain. I think we should look at the example of Germany, which has seen a very large program of labour market reform over the past 10 years. In 2005, German youth employment stood at 16%. It's now 8%. That was the year that Germany exempted small businesses from dismissal requirements. We think this is, and in the British press, it's kind, kind of presented as some kind of neoliberal policy. Actually, it's something Germany did seven years ago. And in terms of it, the argument that it increases insecurity amongst existing workers, they gave existing workers grandfathered rights, so it was about new employees <laughs> and the rights they would have when they were taken on. What Germany also did is they increased the number of mini and midi jobs, which were not subject to the same levels of social security payments where employers would pay a flat tax and workers would receive the face value of their wages. And those mini and midi jobs, which were worth under 400 euros and from 400 to 800 euros 
a month. 30% of those jobs went to the under 20s and the over 60s. So those kind of flexible jobs really target people on the margins of the employment market. And I think it's the kind of thing we need to be looking at to get more people into work who at the moment are struggling to get jobs. We also need to make it much more easy for parents to work flexibly. I think our parental policies have gone backwards. We've had a, a very long period of maternity leave, very short periods of paternity leave. The coalition has plans to introduce much more flexible parental leave, but we need to make sure that this is something that's introduced that makes it more flexible for both businesses and parents, rather than just imposing extra costs. I think what we should do is what Germany has done is allow people to work uh, while they're off on parental leave. In Germany, you're able to work up to 30 hours a week. So you can go in, you can do the occasional meeting, you can do the occasional shift. You're even allowed to work from another employer if your employer won't take you on uh, during that pe period. That helps people keep in touch with the workplace. And women's participation in employment in Germany has gone up by 10% in the last decade, partly as a consequence of that policy. We also, I think, should reform parental pay to have direct flat payments from the government so that parents can choose about how they take uh, their time off and they can negotiate with their employers rather than small employers having to go through <coughs> the paperwork of paying out maternity and paternity pay and then having to claim it back from the government. We should simplify that system and make it much easier. Len's already mentioned the childcare market. Currently, Britain spends twice the OECD average on childcare for the under threes, and yet our parents have the second highest childcare bills in the world. We are clearly getting very bad value for money in the government money we're spending, and that's about the way uh, the market's regulated. It's not uh, necessarily delivering high quality, but what it is is delivering an awful lot of bureaucracy and box ticking, and that should be a key focus uh, for the coalition. I think that we need to be straining every sinew to try and get uh, these policies changed and get more people into work. It's not compassionate to say that we're going to have employment policies that are so onerous that it leaves people not able to enter the workplace at all. And I think we should look at the best international examples about how we can move forward. Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks. Thanks. Um, I'm going to focus on the role of SMEs for a bit and small businesses because <coughs> across the UK we have something like 18 million people who are employed um, in SMEs um, and that is 68% of our workforce and I have to say I have a bit of a local interest here in my constituency, 83% of my constituents work in SMEs as well. So I think touching on Len's point, that role of the ability to become self-employed or work at the local local level market level in small businesses and SMEs is absolutely vital to our economic growth. And there's something key here, which is actually the sort of language and narrative, the tone that comes out of government when it comes to supporting either those that are self-employed or um, SMEs as well, and employability, making it easier to hire as well as fire, but also addressing that whole sort of the, the, the morass, basically, the climate in which they operate. And um, I certainly do think that there is a lot more that can be done, definitely on reducing the burdens of business, the burdens and costs of doing business for SMEs, and effectively freeing up their time from much of the burdensome bureaucracy. I know all politicians and governments talk quite vociferously about cutting back red tape and bureaucracy. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, SMEs in this country and freelancers pay the equivalent of the cost of the Crossrail development each year in complying with red tape. Now, that's a pretty staggering figure. We're talking £17 billion annually on complying with red tape. Um, and this works out in excess of just under £15,000 per business. And quite frankly, as soon as we can start addressing this in a very positive and proactive way, we will um, we'll take away those shackles of doing business and actually empower these businesses and individuals to be much more productive and economically competitive um, for, for our country. And also in terms of employing people and doing business, not just in the UK, but internationally. Um, there is no doubt on the red tape agenda, we have been clobbered over the past few years. I mean, agency workers regulation was just one of those major regulations that came up that has been on the radar for a number of years. But again, another area where we can see less, less regulation and sort of the freeing of burdens. 
I do also think, I mean, we've touched upon the education piece, um, Liz and Glenn have, but there is also this other area in terms of what do we actually do with our young people in schools. Um, the apprenticeship agenda has really taken off, and I do think that's a major success for this government and will continue to be a success story. There is, however, no doubt that where we have a lot of young people in our schools who are just not being stimulated or challenged enough by the education system, there is so much more that can and should be done in terms of incentivising business, small businesses in the local constituencies or communities, but also multinational companies as well, to take on apprenticeships and do more to actually engage with our young people in a much more positive and proactive way, sooner rather than later. I'm sure those members of Parliament that are here today have met many young people on apprenticeship schemes, and I'm taken aback, really, by the fact that it's taken them years and years through such schemes to build up confidence and employability as well. That whole factor of employability is completely lost on, to, on them until they're actually picked up by these apprenticeship organisations. Um, another area where I think we have to focus more as a government and also empower our small and medium-sized um, enterprises to do more is international trade. We hear a lot about and we talk about the brick economies. This country has been talking about the brick economies now for in excess of 15 years. And actually while not doing anywhere near the amount of trade, deals, engagement opportunities which such countries and economies to the extent that we should be. We talk about China, the obvious one to me is India. We have so much common heritage with our two countries and yet we're failing abysmally at the trade piece there. There's also a huge educational piece there when it comes to understanding their own supply side economics and what they've done to turn their own economies around. If you look at the powerhouse of India right now, which is the state of Gujarat, the chief minister there has done phenomenal things in terms of infrastructure developments um, and internal stimulus mechanisms that have created jobs but empowered India's middle class to take ownership, economic empowerment and ownership, while at the same time of funneling their wealth back into the local community and creating good trade as well. There is a lot that we can learn, certainly from these markets, and certainly in terms of building <coughs> proactive and positive business and political relationships for our own economic interests. <coughs> and when it comes to both China and India, not only are we lagging behind, but we're lagging behind to our European competitors, where competitors where both France and Germany are hoovering up major trade deals, both at a national level and international level. But also now, I think we're seeing some regional disparities, certainly in the United <coughs> Kingdom. I know in the east of England as well, and Liz may have picked this up too, there are um, some even councils, county councils, that are falling behind in some trade deals themselves and working relationships and partnerships. So that there's more that can be done, and I think that's both at a Westminster level and also at a local level too. <coughs> Thank you very much. David. <coughs> Thanks very much. Just wanted to pick up on the deregulatory theme in particular uh, that's emerged from all of the other panel members. Uh, some of you may remember Ronald Reagan always had an interesting turn of phrase. And uh, he once said, I know that it can be hard when you're up to your armpits in alligators to remember that you came here to drain the swamp. <laughs> and uh, having spent time as a special advisor in the Cabinet Office and the Treasury back in the mid-1990s, to then come back into Westminster after having spent 13 odd years in the private sector, I can't help but feel there is a sense of deja vu, except a heck of a lot more alligators. A lot more alligators, which we get to groups with. And you can see that in the context, because there are 21,000 regulations that we have on the books. Liz and I trade these stats on a regular basis. She normally has better ones than me, but we'll both agree on the 80, that being 83rd in the, in the deregulatory table, or the regulatory table, is pretty poor when you're behind you know, the huge uh, status powers of uh, Denmark or Netherlands or wherever where, uh, the strong state is very important to the, to the people, to society, and to the economy as well. But we're 83rd in that table. Uh, and the IOD has estimated that the cost of regulation, I know Pretty talked about 17 billion for SMEs, but the cost of regulation to business, uh, there are differing views, but 112 billion pounds is the estimate the IOD put on it. Others have put the cost of regulation just over the last 13 years at 90 billion pounds on business. So. There is a huge target to go after, and I've got to agree with Pretty that the target has to be SMEs because that is going to be the engine for growth in job creation. So we have to focus on what we can do there. Now, the government has made some progress in two key areas. One of them is to dam the flow of new regulation. And so the one in, one out approach is a very important way of at least reducing the flow. Uh, Mark and I have 
some conversations about whether it stopped it or stymied it somewhat. It certainly reduced the flood. But the other thing that needs to happen is you need to start draining the, draining the swamp. And the red tape challenge again has helped move the debate forward on there and, and make some progress. But I wanted to just talk uh, in the time that I've got available about how we need to move the deregulatory agenda to a much higher gear. Uh, in my business experience, if you can't take 10% out of the cost base or anything that you're working with, uh, you're not doing a particularly good job. So if you can take 10% out of the 112 billion, let's pick that figure, of the cost of regulation, you're saving uh, SMEs, businesses, 11 billion pounds a year. If you translate that into the effective change in corporation tax and small profit uh, level tax, uh, that works out at an eight percentage point reduction in those taxes. Now, at a time when George Osborne um, <coughs> and Sarge don't have too much money looking around in the treasury to give away uh, tax breaks to companies, I would have thought that an eight percentage point reduction, the effective eight, eight percentage point reduction on corporation tax would be a great target to go after. So that's the size of the prize we're talking about. And it also helps SMEs work uh, more effectively as well. And my guess is we've probably got about a one-year window now to tackle this urgent priority before we start getting into the next electoral cycle. Because deregulation isn't probably the most sexy side of uh, government policy, but it's vitally important to help move things forward with the job markets we talked about. Um, and as we've been looking at case studies to see how we can move things forward here, there's some very interesting examples. Uh, Ruth, working here at the IRA, and Tim works for me, both come from New Zealand. They always talk about New Zealand in the 1990s, with the major structural changes that took place there. That led to a 6% growth in GDP. 6% growth in GDP. The next example is going to the Netherlands. Again, the Netherlands you don't think of as a particularly deregulatory environment. Uh, the business talk about Germany and what they've done in the labour market. The Netherlands, they tackled the administrative burdens faced with uh, private enterprise. Uh, they reduced it by 25%. That was an effective change of 1% of GDP. Uh, if we had the equivalent change in the UK, that would be a 14, 14 billion pound change uh, and improvement for business. So there's some big targets to go after here, and some countries have shown us the way. Perhaps the most interesting one, and I don't uh, want to sort of target my uh, Liberal Democrat uh, colleagues in the coalition, but um, some of you may remember Paddy Ashdown, who served as the High Commissioner in uh, that well-known uh, Bosnian situation <coughs> post-war. They had a terrible situation. The country was completely regulated to a point where it just couldn't work very effectively. So Paddy uh, put forward his deregulatory credentials. I wish some of the other Liberal Democrats would do the same. And created a bulldozer commission to challenge hard on all of the, uh, the, the challenges that were facing businesses. They identified 50 major regulations they wanted moved in 150 days. Created a, a business engagement with the, uh, in this commission and they were able to see that successful change move through. So, uh, I think we've got an opportunity now uh, with some available options around improving business engagement. We need to see some sort of commission created where we bring business, small and big, to the table, uh, set out a clear agenda for change, set some aggressive targets, and then push hard to make that happen over a year period. The next thing is uh, to work out how we can restructure the deregulatory processes. I think it's time for an independent office of deregulation, not regulation, but deregulation, that again would be uh, empowered to work with uh, a cabinet minister. I think we need to, uh, uh, there's time to look now at appointing a, a clear accountability within the cabinet to drive this agenda forward, to focus on targets that need to be achieved. I'd suggest, as I said, a 10 percentage point reduction, a 10 percent reduction in cost of administration as a target, and then starting to link <laughs> civil service objection, objectives to deregulation. Not as currently is the case, reward them for piling more regulation on. But once there are clear targets, start linking civil service, um, civil servant performance to that. Um, and all of these things would then be pushed forward by, uh, by the Commission in the short term. I think there's also a chance to restock the deregulatory toolkit that we have. Um, I think and the Federation of Small Businesses is being articulating this, uh, a clear name uh, for some exemptions for business, whether it's pensions or demands or requests for flexible working. Other ideas have been put forward by the panel members. I think we could look at the temporary three-year moratorium on regulation for small businesses and make that a rolling program. So there's a three-year window before any regulation comes into place uh, to help smaller businesses prepare for that. 
I think uh, there are other mechanisms as well uh, where we could seek to get real-time feedback uh, for any changes to, uh, to regulatory, um, the reg to the quality laws or regulations. So that any new website is created a, a clear feedback mechanism there and then rather than having to wait for some consultation exercise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just wanted to one, one last point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for taking my phone away. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the need for a bazooka. <laughs> a bazooka to bring about change in the Euros. But I think it's probably time now to get a proposal in place uh, to tackle the regulatory challenge that we have. No, thank you very much indeed. We've got time for just uh, one or two questions, um, and I'll take the two here and, and then just find Okay, I appreciate that. Nice, yeah. um, I'm interested in the examples of international examples that um, you did for the regulation. Um, and certainly in the Netherlands, and definitely in Germany, um, the Hartz IV uh, changes, the post PISA um, report changes, um, were done in, in a country that is built on consensus. Um, it was painful, but they managed to get it through with um, a lot of persuasion. Um, how do you imagine that those changes would happen um, here in the UK? Yeah, as I said, I, I think one of the challenges at the moment is we don't have the, have the engagement uh, across the cabinet in the same way that we do with the deficit reduction, which is a clearly articulated priority with clear targets. We need a similar approach, or have the opportunity to create a similar approach with deregulation with, again, clear targets, and then most importantly, get business to the table. And I think when you speak to a lot of businesses, at small, the small businesses, there's just a sort of a sense of fatigue. The big businesses, they can look at these regulations as an opportunity for barriers to entry. So we need to fundamentally change that, bring, bring them to the table, and then have a clear, focused, time-limited approach of one year, of pushing through an agenda, and really yield the sort of benefits that Germany and Netherlands have seen. So that then creates the agenda, but then you're looking at the huge um, interest bodies of opposition to, to these challenges. Can I just ask you, just on the, on the PISA thing, I think, I think it's very interesting because in 2000, you know, the entire German country was shocked by the results in PISA and they decided we collectively need to do something about that. And despite the fact that we're 28th in the world for maths, you know, 16th for science and 25th for reading, there isn't a PISA shock in Britain. I mean, there ought to be, but there isn't. I mean, the only positive signs I do see is I think um, Labour in, in changing their shadow education secretary have now at least acknowledged that PISA is an issue. And Stephen Twigg mentioned that in a recent speech. So I see more positive moves in the direction of a consensus developing on education and just the real need we have to seriously upgrade our system. I think on deregulation it's harder. And one of the reasons that I've been putting the arguments in Denmark is actually another example of a country which has got now, you know, moving towards a more deregulated labor market, as is other parts of Scandinavia. So I say, look at the rest of the world, look at these countries where it's succeeding. You know, Germany is now exporting 50% of its GDP because it's able to compete with these countries. And unless, unless we all wake up to this, we are going to be facing a declining Britain, you know, compared not just to the, the sort of rising tigers of the East, but also to other European countries. So I think that argument has to be made, and I hope you know this is part of making that argument. Yeah, I mean, Which I would I very much just like to build upon this point there. I mean, there is no doubt, I mean, this is that collective shock to the system that is clearly required. I mean, I don't know what we're waiting for, because, you know, how much louder do we have to scream out? And, you know, how much more pain does the public have to take as well? I mean, the reality is, I mean, I think we're sort of, dare I say this, it might, might be seen as an Essex term, but dancing around handbags here as well. <laughs> in the sense that, you know, this isn't just about politicians coming to the table. You know, there is a major machinery of government here. It is called the civil service, which is rather big, costs quite a bit of public money as well. You know, this is about getting the collective will, the real insights that will bring that sort of shock treatment to the system so that they recognise that you have to sort of sit up, wake up, smell the coffee. And it's not just about, dare I say this, the arm of the state, i.e. the machinery of government just sort of thinking about how do we solve this problem. It is about bringing on board the industrialists. Look at, yeah. I mean, Germany is absolutely key here. India is as well. But a single, you know, bit of government business in India doesn't happen in terms of trade, development, infrastructure without an industrial link. That is effectively what we need in this country. We're crying out for it. We are desperately behind the curve here. And we really do need that shock system to come sooner rather than later. 
Let's talk about small business into two forms, I think. You've got a sort of necessity entrepreneur who may start a new business, maybe a restaurant, because they, they don't have other opportunities because they want to run a restaurant and they want to be their own boss and they don't want to become the next McDonald's. Uh, from maybe on, opportunity entrepreneurs who might be focused on becoming a very big business and become the high growth gazelles. Now those two types of business will be important for very different reasons, but it strikes me the first, the critical barrier is uh, things like regulation which make it very difficult to run a business, but for the second, the critical issue is rewards if you succeed in, with the substantial risks that you're taking and therefore the tax system becomes extremely important. I think the same could apply to women in employment where I think we can focus on the regulatory issues, but I think a lot of the academic literature would just suggest the straight out return of the tax is particularly important uh, for, for women and there's a strong literature on that. And therefore, you know, we can sort of you know play around with that with details of maternity and paternity, which is important, but that tax system becomes ex tax reform becomes extremely important for women. Yes. Well, I mean, yes, yes, you're right. Although I think, I think that attachment to the labour market is very important. And what what tends to happen is because of our very rigid system, people are out of the labour market for a number of years, lose their skills and human capital, and go into the labour market at a lower level, which contributes to basically an economic loss. So I think it's a problem from that point of view. You're absolutely right for the. For the, for the marginal workers, if you like, things like the tax regime is very important. And one of the things I was going to say is that I'm a strong supporter of taking low, low income workers out of tax. You know, I think that's very important in in this whole agenda. But the, but it's also the way they pay tax. And at the moment, you know, the PAYE, the national insurance system, is very, very cumbersome. One of the things the Germans did with their mini jobs is that the employer just pays one flat rate to a single agency no more of the sort of complex social security payments. And I think creating a new kind of flexi contract would be a good way of changing our, you know, driving change in our entire tax system. Thanks, we have overrun our time, uh, I'm afraid. Um, I have overrun my target. I don't think I've missed my target by the same percentage as I've missed its deficit reduction target, but I've nevertheless missed, a, missed oh. the target. Um, I was delighted, we're always delighted to hear Ronald Reagan, of course, uh, alligators and swamps being one of his best uh, lines. My favourite is when he pointed out that the nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm, here, I'm from the government and I'm here to help.